Um, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for we're starting a couple minutes late. That's me. That was on me. My name is Sandra Sheffrey, and I'm the president of the Democratic Women's Club of Greater Broward. And I have the opportunity to speak to Jen Perriman. She's the U.S. House of Representative candidate for District 23. So one of the reasons why I do this is because I like to give the um, candidates an opportunity for them to lay out their plan, lay out their platform, what it is um, that they plan on doing for the constituents in their district. You know, there are a lot of panels going on and you guys are probably sick of it. But one of the things that I notice is that sometimes people don't have enough time to talk, right? They're just, they're giving like 22 minutes to do an introduction, 60 seconds to answer a question, 30 minutes, 30 seconds for a rebuttal. And sometimes that's just not enough. So um, here I am today speaking with Jen Perriman. Her website is gen2020.com and she's going to tell you why you should vote for her in order to send her to Washington, D.C. All right, introduce yourself, Jen. Hi, thank you so much for having this because actually other than the Progressive Caucus that had a huge round table with a bunch of candidates, you are actually the only Democratic club slash caucus anybody in the area to invite me to speak and that has even acknowledged that my race is happening. So thank you for that. So oh. I, I am Jen Perlman and I am a candidate for Florida's 23rd district. And I am a second generation native to this area. I was born in North Miami Beach, grew up there, um, second generation Jewish native to um, South Florida, left for about 15 years, went to college, went to grad school, went to law school, and eventually resettled here in 2003 with a husband, one child, and now there's another child. So that's the quick, that's the quick bio. So my, my background is in journalism and marketing and law. And coming out of law school, I did criminal defense. And where I was living in Texas, there were, in Texas, in the major cities, there are no public defender's offices. So when you have um, defendants that cannot retain, afford to retain counsel, they take appointments from the bench. So essentially, attorneys like me would go to court and a judge would just hand out different cases as they came through. So it was essentially being a public defender and then you would turn in your, your um, log sheets and then you would get paid from the county so so, is, so in florida they have something similar for like if, especially it's usually for cases that have to conflict out of the pd's office you have to register to be on this wheel and like if your name comes up is that how that works yeah yeah okay. essentially it's the same concept and for me it was just a matter of i had a new baby and it was so convenient to be able to pick and choose what days if i didn't feel like taking a case i didn't have to go in if I wanted a case, I could just go in, hang around the courtrooms, and you would just get a case. Like, it was just, it, it allowed flexibility that you don't normally have, especially doing criminal defense. So I was very appreciative. And I, and I saw the disparity, and I knew about it. I always knew um, it, it, racial injustice, but really more of an economic injustice that is just an across-the-board problem, and just in general justice. So forward many years later, and I was actually asked to do this by um, some people in the Progressive Caucus. This is not a career move for me. I actually see representation as a term of service, not a career. Our goal is to get the corporate money out um, one district at a time. So we are 100% people funded, no corporate money, no PAC money, no law firms of corporate money, uh, all individual donations. I take donations from $1 I've had more $1 donations than max donations. I think I've only had two max donations in a year of doing this. So we are people funded. And that way when we win, we will not answer to corporations, we will not answer to special interests, and we will not answer to the Democratic Party. We will only answer to the people of District 23. All right, that's definitely the thing. And you touched on a lot. And one of the things um, when you, you you were talking about flexibility, that's one of the struggles that working moms have, right? So like when you're working, when you know, especially, you know, women, you know, working mothers, you know, we have to balance our careers and particularly if we, we made, we took a, cho made a choice to, you know, be a professional. And then when you have children, you have it in a mix. It's a really difficult, you know, decision to make. And some, some of us have the luxury of like not working or working part time. There are others who have to get up and go to work every day, right? So that brings up the whole thing of um, child care. You know, um, they, you know, they had these um, no kid left behind policies, all of these different types of things. What is it that you think you can do um, for the working mothers of District 23 to help them with the struggles that they have with child care? So first, let me tell you, just from as a matter of my perspective on this, 
I've seen it from each angle and from various socioeconomic uh, positions, just personally. Right. So right out of law school, my husband was a resident. He was working a hundred and maybe figure back in that day, 120 hours a week. And he was maybe making 30 grand a year. Okay. And I was just out of law school. So I had to work and I was working full time and my son had to go, my had a baby and he had to go to daycare. There was no choice. It just had to be that way. So I've done that. I have also tried working part time uh, with with children. And I've also stayed at home. I've done all three. And actually the hardest thing to do is work part-time because you end up working full-time anyway, except for you just don't get paid full-time. Exactly. Yeah. But to me, this is a very multifaceted problem. It isn't just about um, working moms. It's just in general, what do we provide as a social safety net for our people? And what do we value? So for one, I support Medicare for all. I support a $15 minimum wage. I support paid family sick, paid medical and family sick leave. I support unions. I support, you know, I support living in a world where people can afford to stay home with their children and get subsidized to do so. I, I want to live in a world where preschool and childcare are things that we want to provide for people. Um, so it's, I would venture to say that my entire platform in one way or another addresses these kinds of issues of economic injustice. Yes, definitely. And when you're talking about, um, you know, paying people to stay at home with their children, I have a friend of mine that lives in Germany and she was able to stay home for three years with her kid before, you know, she had to go back to work and she got, you know, got money every month and was able to take care of her son and stay home because they recognize that those years are important. They're formative. And she was able to stay home without them worrying about, you know, getting evicted and, you know, not being able to eat. Right. So that's definitely, uh, um, you know, something that, you know, we wish they can do, but, you know, let's try to, let's do it like right side by side, right? So one of the things that you said that's also important to me is healthcare. Healthcare is one of those things that I struggle with all the time. I, you know, I had, there was a time I couldn't get insured because I had what they call pre-existing medical conditions. So it was hard. So I have an office. So I was able to get insurance through my company, but it was so expensive, right? And then, you know, and then I have children. And then once you add them to the plan, it's like, it's, I mean, if it's hard to pay, I don't know how, you know, people who have like just a regular job or in a regular type situation, how they how they can do that. And then I also fell into that middle where I'm not poor enough to get any government assistance, but then I'm not wealthy enough for me paying for all of these expenses doesn't like literally cramp my lifestyle, right? So I feel like I'm just literally going to work to just pay pay out. Um you said you're um down you you're um you're interested in medical care for all and that you support oh. that. So tell us what that means, what that looks like. Okay, so the biggest problem with healthcare in this country is that we have a profit motive. And healthcare, public education, and corrections ought not be for-profit industries ever. And in this country right now, all three are for-profit. So we need to remove the profit motive from our healthcare system. That's the first underlying problem. We do not need private insurance companies. We do not need to be raked across the coals by big pharma. We do not need any of those things dictating our healthcare in this country. So my, uh, for me, Medicare for all is my number one priority. That's the biggest thing in terms of the most biggest priority on my platform. I think that would make the single greatest change in the fastest time to most people's lives. I think the trickle up economy of that would be, I don't even think we can really conceive of it because when you think about all the people that are struggling to pay for healthcare, well, if you have healthcare, now you can maybe afford to get a new card this year. Maybe you can afford to do some extra Christmas shopping this year. When you give people their healthcare, you're, inject, you're automatically injecting money into our economy because the people that we are talking about will put their money back in, their consumers. So healthcare, first and foremost, has to get done. And we need to take out the insurance company middleman. We don't need it. Every other developed nation in this world has one form or another of universal healthcare. Now, my suggestion, and this is just being reasonable, is that we look at what works best in those countries and we create something from that. You know, it, this is not rocket science. It's greed and a profit motive. That's it. We have the resources and we have the financial capability of having that. In fact, even the most conservative study done by the Koch brothers, this was, I know this is probably like a few years ago already. The most conservative study says that Medicare for all saves us $2 trillion over 10 years. We have the worst health outcomes of all developed nations and specifically for women of color. The, um, 
inf maternal and infant mortality rates in this, in this country for women of color is astronomical. And it's exponential to that of white women. So everything that happens in this country to all of us will affect our most vulnerable communities exponentially. That's just how it works. So yeah, to me, Medicare for all, it's, it's just, it's, I won't even, I can't even negotiate it anymore. That's right. like, that's like arguing with flat earthers to me at this point. <laughs> I'm just done. I'm done discussing it. Okay. So what about, you know, you know, uh, a lot of people in America, they believe that this is a free country and we have a right to choose. Everybody wants choice. I mean, so much so that people are, they want to be able to choose whether they should wear, wear a mask or not. Right. Even though we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, the state of Florida had like 13,000 cases like just today, right? Um, positive cases just today, we have choice. So what about people that say, you know, I have a good job and I love the insurance that my job gives me. And now you're trying to take my insurance away and give me this Medicare for all thing. I, I, I don't want that. So how yeah, do you, you know what? It's really just a matter of educating people. And those talking points, those choice talking points, those are neoliberal corporatist talking points that were created by the corporations to throw that out to make people think that they actually have a choice. I have not met a single person that likes their insurance company. They like their doctor. They like their hospital. They like where they go. What if you tell these people, everything for you stays the same, except for now you have no copay, no premium, and no deductible, and you still get to go to your doctor and do exactly what you're doing. You don't need an insurance company. No other country has this. And the idea that we have healthcare tied to employment, what we are seeing right now with the mass amounts of unemployment because of this pandemic, if that doesn't make it very clear that healthcare and employment do not go together, there is no rational connection between healthcare and employment. That is a facade that was made up in this country. And many business owners would love to not have to be paying for their employees' health care. My husband is actually a physician, has a medical practice here in Broward. And so on the one hand, we're a medical family. And most of the time, medical families don't want Medicare for all because you think it can definitely hurt your income and your salary. But on the other hand, which, you know, yeah, it's a concern. I mean, you, you know, it could happen, whatever. But on the other hand, he loves the idea of not having to cover his employees' health care. So, you know, a lot of people that are saying this need to think about it from the small business owner's perspective. You know, how would we be benefited if everybody had health care? If everybody had health care, we wouldn't be in half the mess we're in right now with this COVID. Right. And we have a lot of people saying that. And I was talking to another young man that's running for a Florida um, um, state Senate seat. And we were talking about the health insurance. And like, for instance, I also know people who work for, Mo for Walmart, right? And they work for Walmart and they don't get health insurance from Walmart because Walmart makes them work 29 hours a week. Don't let them fall into that full time, you know, situation where they have to provide health care, you know, that type of thing. And then the other ones who do get to work more hours, they're actually, they work at Walmart, but they're subcontracted and paid by another company, right? So they're even like the big corporations that can afford to pay people, pay health insurance and provide it, they find ways to um, get around it. And I don't want to only like target Walmart because I'm sure it's um, other people that are doing it. But like, oh, yeah. it really is like, the, uh, you know, these big corporations, they're like the best marketing tool and they have us, con you know, they have regular folks convinced that it's something that they don't want, even though it's for their, it's for their best interest. So you're right. We definitely need to educate the public more about that. We have to do better because, again, I, you know, I was in situations where um, health insurance is literally something that I every every year I have like drama, you know, getting health insurance, picking a plan. And even when you think you pick a plan that makes sense, it ends up not making sense, right? I, you know, we, my brother and I, we went through, we say, oh, wait, this one is great. Then I go to the doctor and I have a $90 copay. I'm like, what? I was like, if I paid myself and went to like a urgent care, I'd pay like $75, but um, you're going to get paid from, I don't know what amount from the insurance company and I'm going to pay you a $90 copay. So right. it's like, you're, you, you just don't know how to win. Like, I mean, it's so like, I tell people this, if you, yeah, I tell people this, if you add up in your, in your head, what you spend every year on copays, premiums and deductibles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whatever that number is, let's just say it's $5,000 for somebody. I don't know. Just make up a number. And now that is going to go away. You are no longer going to have that. Would your, could your taxes go up? Yeah, they could go up a little bit, but it will be a fraction of what you were paying in those other costs. And that's what people don't understand. So when, when people are telling you your taxes will go up, well, no, actually, if we were calling all those things what they really are, which is healthcare taxes to begin with, 
then we would be seeing that go down with Medicare for all. Because those things, make no mistake, that's something that people are forced to pay and they're still not happy with what they're getting for it. It right. might as well be your health care tax. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And, you know, and, and again, it is definitely something that we could talk about all day. Um, it's, it's a it's a real struggle. And it's unfortunate that, you know, people are convinced that they don't need health insurance, you know, and, and, and we pay out so much. Like, for instance, you know, we're paying every year and it's and you really pay just in case something crazy happens. Right. Because most of the time people are paying like and I paid a lot. So you said five thousand. I'm like, I wish it was only five thousand. Right. <laughs> it was it was significantly more than that. And I had and I probably went to the doctor like four times that year right so i paid out you know this high premium paid a deductible and i literally went to the doctor four times this year but i'm also a person that had a major health issue and i was like thank god i had insurance when yeah. it happened because you know i literally would have gone bankrupt you know had i not had health insurance so and, and it's a it's a stress that everyone has and i think if we can really get medicare for all passed then people would realize that you know that's one less thing of all the thousands of things that you have to worry about every day you know um because it it does create a level of anxiety that they don't take into consideration. Yeah, having to choose between food and medicine. Can you imagine, you know, your kid is sick and you can't afford the medicine for your, this is no parent should have to have that. No parent should ever have to go to sleep at night and feel like they're not able to provide health care for their children when it's available. Mm -hmm. Okay, this isn't about lack of resources, right? This is just about greed and allocation of resources. Right. And that is something that is just unacceptable to me. And there's another example to that too. Like a lot of us live in multi-generational homes, right? And my father passed away in 2014 and he had Alzheimer's. And I remember like, again, with insurance, we thought we picked the right one, but they didn't. And he had to take, uh, I can't remember what it was, but it was one of the medications is Alzheimer medication. It was $200 a month, right? It was literally $200 a month. And then he had another one that might've been a hundred and something. And, you know, my parents were, they get like social security, which is another conversation about how they want to privatize social security. It's such a drain on the system. If, if people know what the amount of my parents' social security check was is it's like an absolute joke right it's like an absolute joke you can't live off it and you know luckily we're older so we were able to help subsidize my parents medication but again that's one of those things not a lot of people can do and i've even been at the pharmacy before where this guy i don't know what medicine he was getting and they said it was like a thousand dollars or something and he was like what i can't afford it and the man drove off so i'm like if he needs some medicine that costs a thousand dollars that's not like it's something that's going to save his life right and he literally could not get it because he couldn't afford Support for it. And you know, again, we can have a thousand of these stories. I'm glad to hear that you're supporting that. I really hope it's something that passed because um, even though people think they don't want it, they, they want do. it. Yeah, right. Because even the people who like say, oh, they don't want Obamacare, but they, you know, because I remember there was a thing on Facebook one time. This guy's like, I don't have Obamacare. I have an Affordable Care Act. And then someone was like, well, that is Obamacare, right? Because they didn't like the name of it, but they liked all of the benefits. Right. Right. So hopefully we can get something like this passed. And, um, we can get I told my son not to we can get something like this passed and uh we don't have to deal with uh, we don't have to deal with this right that's my goal yes yes thank you so so another thing happened today i almost wore my like i am an immigrant shirt but uh it was downstairs and i was like it was time for me to get started because right before i came on i saw uh uh it was uh that the president is ref they're rejecting DACA applications. Are you familiar with DACA? Because immigration is another one of the big things that, particularly yeah. in South Florida, you know, um, it's a really big thing. What can you do? What would you do to try to help, you know, uh, a lot of these um, children? And DACA is one of the ones that's really specific because it's for kids who came to the United States. It's not their fault. Their parents made that decision to bring them here without any documents. And a lot of them didn't even know, you know, and they grew up here thinking they're American and they're in this situation and they have no relief. What would you do for a DACA recipient? And would you try to um, uh, uh, put forward a bill or co-sign on a bill that would give them a path to residency and then citizenship? Yeah, first we need to be staying all deportations during this pandemic right now. So like as an immediate situation, we need to be stopping any deportations that are happening right now. But the way we treat immigrants is the same way we treat, I don't know, everybody that isn't, you know, in a certain level of our society that we consider worthy of being the recipients of the benefits of our society. So to me, I just have this general mindset of how we treat the most oppressed among us. And it is just not okay with me. So this is also another thing where there's a profit motive. 
You have a profit motive with incarceration. When all of those children were being held in homestead, do you remember? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. they were making, I wanna say it was like $795 per, per, per head per day. Per day. And these are for-profit companies, they're shareholders. There's, this, is, this is a very sick, sick thing. And you know, it's, to me, these types, immigration infractions, to me, should be like civil citations. I, I agree with Julian Castro in this regard. I do not think that people who, who come here Ill, illegally need to be anything more than fined. And yeah, there needs to be a proper protocol for everybody to come here, but we should always be erring on the side of kindness and compassion, and we just don't, right. because we err on the side of greed and corporations. And so to me, there are, there are probably numerable, numer numerous uh, legislative pieces that are sitting, uh, that there, you know, there's over 800 pieces of legislative legislation sitting in Congress right now that can't pass because they can't get enough support. And, and people don't realize that there's a lot of good stuff sitting there, but the DACA recipients need to be given amnesty. So this is something where, first of all, why we would not want these people here is beyond me. I don't understand. Right. These are like the brightest people. Like these are the people that are specifically here for the purpose of being educated and contributing and being productive. Like that's right, their right. purpose. Yeah, right, because they have to go to part of what their submission is that their school the records, right? That they yes. went to school here. A lot of them are college students. And I believe that's part of the reason why they've had, they've been able to put up such a huge fight is because that is a very educated group um, of immigrants. It, it very is. And even when the fight started, I was like, he, this, the president doesn't know what he's getting involved with because these kids are not going to back down. This is a no. very, very educated group of immigrants. And nor should they back down. And, you know, I, I mean, at this point, I, I just find it, the fact that we're still arguing about this, this is sort of like, uh, virtue signaling. This is sort of like whistling to his base. This is rallying up anti-immigrant sentiment. This is all politics. They are using right. these people as little pawns in political theater that is otherism. And we have to, the other, fear of the immigrant, fear of the Russians. It's the Muslims. It's the, you know, people coming up from Central America. These people, this is, and that's not the problem. Remember it's the caravan the from 2018? Remember there was a caravan coming in 2018 yeah. right before the election? And then all of a sudden, we didn't hear anything about this caravan of folks, you know? And you know what? Here's the thing. Most of the people that are coming from there are people that are desperate to get out of a dangerous and horrific situation that we caused, <laughs> that largely we're responsible for because of the drug cartels and the problems that in their countries. These are people that are just trying to get their kids alive from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. These are not the enemy. These are not people to be scared of. These are not people that need to be incarcerated. It's really how we treat people just needs to be completely looked at. I mean, it, I don't even think we qualify as um, human standards by international law. I mean, right. I, I actually think we're in violation in numerous places. Yes, yes, absolutely. And you know, and, and the crazy thing is like, even in South Florida, like when COVID happened, um, some of the great attorney, um, immigration attorneys, they filed litigation to get people released because of COVID and they still refused to release them. You know, they wouldn't release, and they wouldn't even admit that there were people there that tested positive, even though it was. And then when it came out, the judge was like, listen, you got to get these people out of there. They're like, nope. They're like, and folks are like, okay, we'll post a bond. And we're not talking about criminals, right? We're not only talking about criminal aliens. We're talking about people, all they did was come to the United States without the proper document. They have family members here, people that are willing to, you know, um, vouch for them and make sure that, and they're still like, nope, they're going to detain them. And like you said, it's a profit motive because, and I'm like, and if you really wanted to save the government money, why would you detain this person? Because I actually have a client that's detained right now since like January. And I can't go to the uh, facility to see him now because of the COVID situation. Right. So he's literally been there since January. We can't go forward because they want to do this case on the phone. And I'm like, how am I going to do it on the phone? I can't even talk to the guy, right? So, it, so they keep continuing it. Um, and we're, we're going nowhere. And he's been there since January. And we asked for a bond. And they, they, they would have just given him a bond and let him get released. And we're about to be eight months deep by the time we go back to court the next time, right? So this is the kind of, um, I think, waste that's happening that people don't understand, you know? Um, 
the people aren't aware of and all they think about like, oh, no, no, they shouldn't have tried to come here. And, and another thing, right, is that some of the people who come in that way, they've had petitions filed by family members. They've been waiting years, some of them three years, some of them five years, some of them 10 years. You know, they tried to do it the right way, right? And then they weren't uh, allowed to come in. And in the family separation, sometimes it becomes too much. There are people who they have their kids and they don't get to see them grow up because, you know, they can't get the uh, paperwork um, done, you know. So definitely immigration is one of those things. I'm glad to hear that you want to do something for the DACA recipient. There's another group of people that have been here, and I have some of those clients um, that, that have temporary protective status, that have TPS. And, uh, you know, um, some of my clients have been here since 2000. They were granted TPS in 2010. Is that another group of um, individuals you'd be, and, and if they've been here that long, they've already shown you that they're not a problem, right? Because right. for you to have TPS, you're not a felon. You can't be a convicted felon um, and have it. So would you also be willing to, you know, put forward <laughs> or support some legislation that would give, um, you know, a path to citizenship, residency to people of temp that have temporary protected status? Absolutely. Uh, you know, absolutely. To me, the entire concept of violating immigration laws being something that is worthy of criminal penalty or incarceration is just completely unnecessary. Well, they call it detention. They say it's an administrative process and they're being- Yeah, no, it's incarceration. I've seen it. So they can call it whatever they want. They could call it camp. <laughs> doesn't make it be so but no that to me should not ever be anything for people to we can discuss various paths to citizenship timing how that works how we're going to allow people to become citizens that's all something that is you know there's negotiable areas as to how to go about that what's not negotiable is how we're treating people that are in that process so to me unless you are a violent person you don't need to be incarcerated and that that includes everybody and that includes people that are from other countries. That includes, if you come from another country and you're violent, then by all means, you should be incarcerated. But the idea of being here illegally in and of itself, to me, is not something that should require um, that level of prosecution. I just, I don't see it that way. And particularly with uh, with the children too. That's like you know uh, you know, and then for you to like detain kids, separate them from their parents. You don't even have a tr you don't even know what who's whose kid it is anymore. That type of thing. Um, you know, they don't care. This is like there's absolutely no humanity anymore. ICE is an organization, an agency that doesn't need to exist. We didn't need it before. We don't need it now. It's essentially to me. I think of ICE as the Gestapo. And I don't see the point of it. So I, I support abolishing ICE. I don't think it's a necessary agency. And, um, you know, when we treat people like that, it is so unbelievably short-sighted because these are people that are now, these are children whose lives are being ruined, depending on what age they are and what they're going through and how long they're there. I mean, some of these kids in very formative years, you're ruining these kids' lives and you're also most likely creating sociopaths. Right. So you are creating people that are going, and uneducated, mind you, uneducated sociopaths. How does that benefit us in any way? Like, it just, it does, it's just punitive and it's hateful and it's really about creating a society where we're punching down instead of punching up. And I feel like it's incumbent upon us, uh, incumbent upon us to remind us uh, ourselves to constantly be punching up and not down. The people, this is what I tell people all the time. I can assure you that no matter what your problems are in your life, financial problems, personal problems, whatever your problems are, they are not caused by the people that are just coming here to just seek a better life. That is never going to be the cause. The people that are struggling to live are not the cause of your problems ever. So right. the problems come from up there. And so, and what they want us to do is punch down. Right, right. And, and fight amongst each other and blame each other for problems that we, we didn't cause, we didn't create, we can't control, we can't yeah. undo or anything like that. So while we're fighting against each other, they're just like not worried about it and they continue to do what it is um, that yeah. they yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's like a, they cause this distraction. Yeah, it's her fault, you know, and really it's their fault, right? Because they have Yes, the people with the power are the people that are in a position to do something to better the situation. The people with no power that are coming over here with the clothes on their back, just trying to get by and not be killed in violent gang warfare, those people are not the source of our woes. 
Like that's just not, the, that's just not how it works. That's not how any of this works. It doesn't work that way. And it's, it, it, and it's, it's definitely, uh, yeah, something that, you know, we definitely need an ally and someone that's going to go and like fight for that. And hopefully there's a lot of change in DC uh, with in November the 3rd, 2020. I just hope it's a lot of change in order for these great ideas and all of these things to get, um, to get pushed forward. The other thing that we're hap that's happening um, uh, besides the pandemic, and we'll get into COVID, um, uh, a little bit more too, but one of the other things is that um, we on March twenty on May twenty fifth, um, a lot of people saw a video where George Floyd was killed, literally killed on camera by a police officer, and it it caused so much outrage. And and not only was it outrage, it also brought about a level of awareness that some people didn't have. Right, so you know a lot of times black people were you know people of color were screaming on top of their lungs about how they were mistreated by police officers, and no one understood. They didn't see like what are you talking about? That doesn't happen. And then it happened. Right, at least it, it's been happening, but at least people saw it happen, and they saw it happen in such a graphic and just horrific terrific way that there was just no 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 longer uh, an ability to ignore it you just couldn't ignore it anymore right to the point where even um uh, Minneapolis, they decided to just, they, they shut down their whole police department, right? So now we have this whole movement of defunding the police. I mean, I think the word they really want to use is reform and defund is kind of to make people not like it because that's, you know, the way they, so what um, are you, what are your thoughts on criminal justice reform? What would that look like to you? And, and you know, and what is it that you could propose or would support um, if you're um, sent to DC? Criminal justice reform is one of my biggest issues. It's healthcare, climate crisis, and criminal justice reform are our top three, but my background is in criminal justice. So it's the area that I have the most up close and personal relationship with. And the first thing that needs to happen is again, we need to take the profit motive out. There can never be a profit motive to incarcerate people. There can also not be a profit motive in policing people. Right. We currently have a profit motive in both of those areas. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. We also need to end qualified immunity. We need to take uh, settlements out of police pensions instead of taxpayer dollars. And I support the campaign zero reforms. Are you familiar with the campaign Tell zero? Tell us what it is. Tell us what it is. Yeah, you know what? And I wish I could remember them off the top of my head. I want to say there's eight or 10 categories that have a, ranging from demilitarization, um, citizens, uh, civilian oversight boards, um, the uh, ending qualified immunity. Like there's a whole bunch of different aspects of this. And I support all of those things. And my only problem with the defund the police is I knew it was just going to scare too many people off. Right, the words. And, and unnecessarily. So what I always say is to people who I think might tend to be more scared by that, I sort of have to take them by the hand. You have to kind of stroke them. You know, it's okay. We're not, we're still going to have law enforcement. Nobody's going to come hunt you down and kill you in your house in the middle of the night. It's okay. So it's really a matter of, I, we, one, we need to demilitarize the police. Absolutely. So, you know, yes, we do need law enforcement, but I want to see law enforcement increased on the back end. Meaning, do you know how many un, untested rape kits, unsolved cases? There are certain crimes that we have less than a 20% close rate on. Why are those not being investigated? When you have an actual homicide, yeah, we, I'd like law enforcement to investigate that. I would. I think that's the purpose of law enforcement not patrolling our streets and patrolling our existence. So I just, I, I feel like we need to understand there is a dis, there, there are functions for law enforcement, not to be called to every little domestic dispute, not to be called for a mental illness, not to be called to the homeless people or drug right. addicts, or We don't need them patrolling and policing us. We need them investigating crimes and solving them. So I don't like the, the framing of defund, right. but it needs to be significantly reduced, demilitarized, and they need to end qualified immunity so that they are liable for when they have infractions. Oh, and I also support having a nationwide database of officers um, that have been found in violation. And what happens is, is, is most of these things are state level things. Like, you know, most policing is handled at the state level to municipal things. So in a federal seat, it's not something where you can come in and dictate how it's done. But what you can do is you can dangle federal funding when people are not working according to complying with your set standards. So for example, if you're local law enforcement and you're gonna hire somebody that's on this registry, you are no longer gonna be getting federal funding. 
That's how you, that's how you control it from a federal standpoint it, with money. Essentially, that's how you do it. But there needs to be federal guidelines. I think we need to have a federal audit essentially like of well of healthcare too but certainly of all of our policing but this is beyond just bias training right like, we're so past that it's this needs to be a massive thing and so really the federal government's job in that is strongly suggesting and right. by strongly suggesting i mean dangling money saying this will happen or there will be no more money and right. and i think that's really where our control is on that level Yes, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. A lot, a lot needs to be, a lot needs to happen, and there are a lot of changes um, that need to be made because, um, and I, and I think that there, there's definitely a movement for that change, right? Because people are just like they're not gonna just be okay with it, right? And you know, this social media stuff right now is definitely is definitely changing the police game. It's definitely changing the game, and like what law, um, officers thought they can get away with, they're not getting away with it anymore. But it's also interesting how even though they know they're on videotape, some of them. Are still so bold and to do i'm like dude don't you see all these phones with cameras on you and you just not gonna stop like is it are you really just not gonna stop right yeah so definitely and uh, we look forward to that um and you talked about cash bail again that's more of like a local thing and more for the it is and cash bail also is something that is one of those like catchphrases that seems like it's just a good talking point but i don't know how much real impact that 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 has the the, the, the Law enforcement already has various means at their disposal at the state attorney's level that really do um, help in a lot of those cases. So I don't know, and it's not a federal issue, but um, yeah, I mean, that's one of those things that I think is more of a talking point than actual effective. Yeah, so I, it's a talking point too, but I know some of those people who wish they didn't have to post that five hundred dollars because it's like ruining the family budget for like the next. Yes. No, months. I, it's right? true. They just um they just don't make that kind of money. All right, so one of the things that you said you're big on um is the uh, the environment, right? And again, I talked to another one of these young guys that are running um for the uh, Florida seats, and they just had like some really cool ideas, and there's a lot of good things coming out of that. And I also think like a lot of people don't realize how much the environment you know environmental issues affect their life on a day-to-day -day basis right because i was like you know that sounds like a fancy people problem right he's like no that's like everybody's problem because you know when you turn that, yeah. that the sink on in the kitchen you want clear water to come out of that sink right so that's w just one of the things that we talked about so tell us what it is that your your plans are for the environment and what it is that you want to do for the people in district 23. so i support a green new deal and for people who don't know what the Green New Deal is, it's not an official policy. It's not anything very specific. It's a mission statement with goals to reduce our emissions uh, enough over the next now only 10 years so that we don't raise the temperature to a level that is not sustainable for habitation on this planet. So this is something that we need to be working toward. It's a mission. And the way that the Green New Deal is set up is it creates a system of social, economic, and environmental justice simultaneously. So you create a jobs program with a $15 minimum wage, a living wage jobs program, and you put people to work building up alternative fuel infrastructures, working on things like our light rail, working on different types of technologies that are gonna take us away from fossil fuels. And this, along with criminal justice reform, I just wanna point out, cannot be done so long as people are electing representatives that are on the payrolls of these interests. And that is something that in every one of these issues we've talked about so far, my opponent takes money from every one of these industries that is essentially working against our interests. And it isn't, I'm not, it, this isn't a personal thing, it's all public information, this isn't you know a secret, but you cannot expect climate to be dealt with when you elect people that take money from Florida Power and Light and the fossil fuel industry, big sugar, it's, it's just, you're not going to get that. And so for somebody to say, oh, I want, I want somebody to deal with climate crisis, but I'm gonna support someone who takes money from big sugar, that's a disconnect, it just doesn't work. And it's the same. You cannot support somebody who takes the second highest amount of money from police packs and expect there to be substantive policing reform. It's, it's really, it's not realistic. 
So the climate needs to be dealt with by people that are not on a payroll for industries that are hurting us. We need to be transitioning to alternative fuels, to clean energy. We need to be investing in transportation. And we need to be giving people jobs in building up these infrastructure. There is so much work to be done in this that it's great jobs. We need to get people out of coal mines, for God's sakes, at this point. Mm -hmm. you know. And yes, there are some people that it might be harder to transition. I do understand that. But in general, it's the best interest of all of us to move forward into clean energy and reducing emissions. And when That's you say you need to invest in transport, I didn't mean to cut you off, but when you say you need to invest in transportation, I mean, I live in South Florida. Public transportation here is horrible, right? Horrible. Like, like if you don't have a car, you, wh how are you going to, you literally would have to say, okay, I'm going to work at this place because yeah. I know I got to get on the bus. I could get there in a reasonable amount of time. Like it really restricts what it is that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis because the transportation here is just so bad, right? Yeah. So like, is We need a whole system. Yeah. We need a whole light rail system. Our country, we are so far behind mm -hmm. the rest of the world when it comes to mass transit. Um, it's really absurd. And there's, you know, we're talking, we have a president that's talking about the space force. Right. <laughs> we need to have a space force. I'd be happy with a light rail system. With a train from like South Florida to Orlando, right? Let's yes. there. Let's have the bright rail open. Let's start with the bright rail and then maybe we could do our space force. So, I mean, these are, and we also need people to rein in the overdevelopment in places like South Florida in particular. We don't have a single congressional, congressional representative down here that I see taking a real leading role in addressing climate crisis. Now, some of them are more willing to sign on things than others. None of them, have um, signed on to the Green New Deal. And so nobody's taking bold steps. What's happening is at the city commission levels and the county level is you see developers overdeveloping, yes. dredging out our mangroves. I live out west and I'm telling you, like it used to be cows there and then like now they're like townhomes and like, you know, you know, whatever, houses for like $500,000. I'm like, but I thought that was like a farm with some cows and it's just more and more development. I'm like, who's moving there? Like, I just don't know. Who but what's it. happening is it's putting the strain on our infrastructure. So at the same time that we're building all these places, <clears throat> so we'll have more people tapping into our fresh drinking water, right? Right. But at the same time, we're having sea level rise. We live on limestone. So as the sea level rises, it actually encroaches into our fresh water supply, right? right. So right. we're not just seeing it as, um, you know, coastal erosion. We're not just seeing it in terms of on the coast. We're seeing it in terms of right in the middle right here as we are going to start to have less and less fresh water. So we're having more and more people moving in with less and less fresh water available. Right. And nobody's talking about this. Nobody wants to fix the infrastructure or even, we're just, our infrastructure in this country gets a grade of D plus by the Army Corps of Engineers. Wow. A D plus. Right. And you, you just talked about FPNL and one of the young men that I, um, and I keep going back to them because they just were talking so much good environmental stuff, right? And they were saying how FPNL wanted to put some sort of line under the fresh water and they were afraid that it was going to seek in. So it's all different types of things that a lot of these big companies are doing. And then we had, you know, Big Sugar with the runoff that we had that algae problem. I mean, we probably still have the algae problem. Yes talking about it but you know we had the red green you know the blue green algae and you know yeah. the red something because you know they're run you know they're putting all of um just run it all into our water stream and people think it's no big deal but it's a huge deal because it, it takes it throws off the entire ecosystem you know like of fishing and all of these different types of things so we do need to be concerned about the environment and what's happening and it's uh, and also people even for people who don't care from a moral perspective in terms of that it's hurting the ecology and it's hurting the critters but financially, we are a tourism state. When you have an exacerbation of red tide and blue-green algae, people aren't going to coastal towns when there's dead fish lining on the beach. They're just not. I canceled. We were going to do a little family weekend on the Gulf Coast at, uh, last two years ago, and I canceled it because they were having this red tide where it was just giant dead fish across the whole beach. So it hurts us financially. So mm -hmm. even appealing to people that care more about the wallet issues it is not good for Florida to not be addressing these climate issues. Right, and to have dead fish on the beach. Right? It's not good. It's just not a. It's not a. It's not a good look at all. It's not a. And then so corporate money. You said you're not taking any corporate money. What can we? How how can you stop that? It's expensive to run these campaigns. Are it's it's expensive to do this. 
So how would it, that, how can you take so many money out if it's so expensive to just try to get people to know you? Um, it's very difficult. I mean, we are we are facing a corporate monolith. You know, I mean, this is not easy. I've been ghosted essentially in the county by the Dam Club. They won't even acknowledge that our race is going on. I'm basically being ghosted. And so most people, because they are very comfortable with the way things are. And what I have noticed in the past year and a half that I've been doing this are the people that are very comfortable, they all have their basic needs met. If your basic needs in life are all met, you're fine with the way things are. You, you're good. You know. But people who are not having their basic needs met, that group is getting bigger by the day. And there are going to be infinitely more of those people than the comfortable people. So at some point, it's got to transition over where we have a representative that is speaking for those people. And you cannot speak for those people when you're taking corporate money. You cannot do both. I cannot represent the people of this district and take big sugar money. I cannot represent the people of this district and take police pack money. It's a conflict of interest, even though it's legal. And that's where, and, and the truth is, is that Debbie, who I'm, I'm running against Debbie Wasserman Schultz, we don't normally address that, she who <laughs> shall not be named. But the reality is she's one of many that do this. It's not, it's not, it's just her. It's all of them. But we are solely people funded. We are all small dollar donations for the most part. And it's very empowering. It's very empowering uh, yeah. to to know that when, because the people that do get through that are non-corporatists, they don't have to spend their time dialing for dollars during the work week. They don't have to be sucking up to corporate clients. They're just actually there to do their job. Right. Right. And yeah. And, and, and yeah, cause the people sit them there and then that's and the people are ones that funded it. They know they had, they know their base, they know what they want. And you know, and it's interesting that you said that the people who have their basic needs met, you know, they're comfortable the way things are. And I'm just like, I have my basic needs met, but I, I well, I mean, I'm black. So, you know, we, it's hard for us to be comfortable anyway. Yeah, right? no, bunch of other problems. But even, even besides that, I'm just like, how can you be comfortable with all of this that's happening, right? Like, we're in a situation right now, like, I don't see how anyone's, um, anyone's comfortable. You have kids in cages. We got coronavirus, like, just killing people left and right because we have, you know, a president that's, that's I, I, I don't even know what to say about him. We have a governor that's just like, he's a mini the version of the president. Yeah, following like all this nonsense and it's it's like how can even if all your needs are met how is it that you can't how is it that you don't see that something's very wrong with the way things are being done and ran and managed at this at this moment it's but a big part of the problem let me tell you what a big part of the problem is is that a lot of the people that are sitting in power even on the democratic side that are corporatists are using this opportunity to say it's all because of Trump or it's all because of DeSantis or, oh, it's the Russians or, oh, it's the this. And it's just not the case. And I, and I, I understand that this is, I am, and I am also a member of the Democratic Women's Club of Florida and Broward, of West Broward. And I, I understand that we're Democrats, but we need to really start to distinguish what that means. Yeah. And not all Democrats are the same. Now, I am a Democrat that supports labor. I am a Democrat that is pro-environment. I am a Democrat that is against the military industrial complex. So, you know, I am what was a Democrat when I became a Democrat. They have become very corporatized and that's just a reality. And so you cannot expect people that are on the payrolls of corporations to speak for labor. So right now in this country, we don't have a labor party. Mm -hmm. We have no labor party. And people are starting to recognize this isn't right. Like something isn't right here. This, it, the, 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 the balance of power is just off. Right. And it's, the, and it's that inequality and people are starting to see it more and more. I mean, the top three richest people in this country, I think made 500 and something billion dollars in the past couple of months. Exactly. That's that's insanity. That's, that's insane. It's so insane. It's so insane. And, and you're right about that, right? Because I have a brother, uh, one of my, my brother, he, he, he's not, he's registered as like no party affiliation or whatever, right? He tends to vote Democratic all the time anyways, but he's like no party affiliation. I'm like, dude, you're not going to, he's like, but no, you don't understand. It's a lot of the I things that Democrats are, are talking about. It, it's not making sense. And he was a, he's a serious Bernie supporter. Like dude is yeah. like, you know, he's like a serious Bernie supporter. And he's like, no, it's all the same and it, like you said they take a lot of corporate money and you know they, they're not gonna rock the boat 
as much because I guess when they get those positions, it's real comfortable and it's real nice and, you know, they don't want to give it up. And it's unfortunate that some people go, they go with the, um, they get there because they said they're going to go there and serve the, the needs of the people. And then they end up, you know, serving their own needs. Right. And I'm not saying they're all doing it. I'm just saying it just seemed like a lot of that's happening and it's not a good thing, even though I, I will acknowledge that during this administration, it was very, it's very difficult to get anything done that makes sense, right? So, you know, a, a little bit is, you know, they're, they're basically hitting their head against a wall. Um, but then some of it too is, you know, you know, they kind of maybe lost, lost their way a little bit. And that's why we need to, uh, you know, maybe work on getting more progressives in office, right? So, yeah, yeah so it, it was definitely good talking to you. And I think we talked about, um, um oh so era that's another one like equal rights for like women and all that oh. kind of stuff that's another one of the big things of um, course what, what, what do you want to say about that uh and yeah i just just what do you want to say about that because i want well to you know and and it's funny because i've actually had people come on and say that you you don't mention lgbtq and yeah. i'm like no i do i just what i did was because you could have a subcategory for everything and so i have a section we have to change the name of it on my website that just says civil rights and it includes various it's got some immigrant issues um uh, uh native american issues lgbtq like i sort of break down who are marginalized groups and essentially it's all about equity for all of those groups it's every single person should be in an equal sort of not just equal opportunity, but we need to build up a social safety net so that everybody has a position wherein we're providing for dignity and respect amongst us. Like there just has to, there needs to be more kindness. I mean, and it really is not complicated. We have homeless people and empty houses. Right. That's a failure. That's a failure of a system. Mm -hmm. Right? So obviously we don't need to be putting homeless people in million dollar condos. Obviously, I'm not saying that, but this is not because we can't shelter people. Right. It's not because we can't feed people. It's not because we can't give them health care. It's we're choosing to profitize things at the expense of people. Right. Because there was actually um, this week, there were some homeless people that got that were able that were given housing for two months. Their vouchers ended on Monday at 11. And they're like, oops, you got to go find somewhere. And it's not like the place is like, oh, we have new people moving in today. So you need to leave. It's just like, yo, your vouchers up. So you got to go. Right. So, yeah. So, like, um, you know, a lot of a lot of that a lot of that is happening too. And I, you know, I would immediately sign the, the equal rights amendment. I mean, there are several pieces of legislation I think sitting right now having to do with that, but yes. And I even think that I specifically mentioned that on my policy page. So if anybody wants to know the details of these, because these were very well crafted at one point when I wasn't, when it was all very well thought out. So Gen 2020, they're all there that all of the, what we, I mean, vulnerable communities are all under civil rights. It's broken down. So um, people can see what I think specifically, but I am definitely unabashedly a pro-choice, pro, you know, women. Right. I'm just pro, I'm pro treating people kindly, you yeah. know, like how, yeah. like, it's not really complicated to me. Right. Yeah. Cause we are going to run into a lot of issues on um, particularly we didn't get to talk a lot about COVID-19 and we'll talk about that, but you know, we have, you know, uh, we have to think about like what, all of this is going to look like, right? So we we're it's five months later, we're still stuck in our houses, you know, barely going outside. And if we are, we're masked up, you know, got alcohol everywhere. And I think I'm probably going to get sick for the amount of sanitizer, hand sanitizer I'm inhaling, right? You know oh. what I mean? Because that's a whole other thing. Because more and more, they have these lists of ones that are not safe, because some people yeah. are watching. To make it so you got to really you got to be real cool um careful about which ones that you use but people are going to have long-term health effects you know yes we already like uh, today i think it's like 140,000 people have died from coronavirus since march that's insane right and it's more to come because all of the icus in south florida are full to, they're they're at capacity which another yeah. form of insanity but what about the people who have like long-term health issues as a result of having coronavirus, right? How are they going to be insured? What is it that you're going to do for them? How are you going to care for them? So these are all things. And, and also, uh, they weren't evicting people. I, I think they've extended it to August 1st uh, because a yeah. lot of people lost their jobs and so they couldn't pay their rent or whatever. And I'm sure the landowners, uh, landlords have like, you know, put, you know, put in the paperwork 
to try to get paid as soon as this is all over. But like, you know, if no one was, if you weren't working since March, you're not going to have five or six months worth of rent in August. So, you know, what are we going to, you know, there's definitely things that we need to do about this and everyone needs to take this in, um, into consideration. So if you uh, were there and you had to put some COVID plan together to help the residents of, of South Florida coming out of this, right? Because if you guys get elected, you're going to start in January. We're going to still be dealing with some side effects of COVID in January 2021. What, what is it that you would propose to help the people um, in your district uh, that were negatively, like seriously negatively impacted by um, COVID? So immediately to me comes to mind and how we would have been better prepared to deal with this and what we should do going forward is obviously Medicare for all, but UBI and universal basic income is one of those things that it's, it, it provides a social safety net. A one-time payment of $1,200 to everybody as a stimulus check is, is outrageous. outrageous. And the fact that the corporations got a $3 trillion slush fund, that money needed to go into, I mean, there's... Well, to the people, but to small business owners. So, and there are various ways to look at how this could have been, been done. You could say things like nationalizing payrolls to a certain extent, putting in, paying for payrolls. I believe Germany or the UK, they did, they paid 80% of employer payrolls as opposed to paying for unemployment. So people technically got furloughed instead of lost their jobs. There are a myriad of things that could have been done to make this have a better result. And instead, we're gonna be living in a Great Depression with shanty towns everywhere, you're right, because eventually everybody's gonna be evicted, the mortgages are gonna be due, people are gonna lose their homes. I mean, this is gonna be way scary and way ugly, and a lot of this could have been avoided. But what needs to happen immediately is financial relief immediately. That means the stimulus needs to go to the people. And to me, the easiest way to do that is a form of UBI, and it needs to be a monthly payment through the duration of COVID. So, and in my world, we would have already been getting a UBI, but right. then what we would get now would be like an additional emergency uh, COVID addition or addendum to your UBI during the, during the shutdown. That would be the way to go about doing this. But again, I wouldn't have uh, had everybody lose their jobs, I would have nationalized certain industries, taken over payroll, and kept people furloughed instead of laid off. So, laid you know, off. this is one of those things where we know there's a better way to do it. Right. It's been done. Canada's done it. Canada handled this great. Yes, yes. They're so, not we know how. Yeah. And it's all kind of effects. So I also teach at one of the um, local col um, colleges and they're going to, sh they sh they're, they're closing their campus next year. Like this is the last year and they're like, okay, we'll find another school for you to go to for, you know, for the students that are there, but they literally, you know, cause they, uh, when um, everything happened, they had to refund all of the uh, on-campus money. You can't live on campus. So they, and so they're like, you know, they realize that financially they can't do it anymore. And these are big companies that have yeah. They're going to completely shut down. So imagine someone that was making just not even a $15 minimum wage that you would propose. They're making like $8 or yeah. know, eight, 50 an hour, whatever it is. And all of a sudden that little bit of money is gone. Like, and what do you do? You know, and we've been home all day. So my electric bill has like doubled. Right. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? So imagine other people who are home all day, like, yeah. you know, you're, ex you're expensive. They're shifting. You're not driving as much, but you're paying more in electricity. You're spending more money on groceries. You're doing all of these different things. So yeah, it's definitely, um, going to be a challenge and it's great to hear that you're going to um you know take this at the helm and try to do something for the people of district 23 so tell them how they can get in touch with you how people can donate and you know and you can do your closing remarks and you can let that be whatever you want it to be in however long sure thank you so much sandra i appreciate it so um the key thing is is in order to vote for me august 18th so our primary is august 18th you need to be registered as a democrat by july 20th so that's in a few Monday. days. That's Monday. Okay, so by Monday. So it's very easy to do. You can go to gen2020.com. You can also request a vote by mail. We have the link for request your vote by mail, which I still recommend people do. I have, I anticipate you don't want to end up with a situation where they close down a whole bunch of polling places because you know they're going to close them in the most disenfranchised communities. Yes. So we need everybody to at least request your vote by mail so that you have it and make sure you're registered as a Democrat. Also, I need, we need phone bank volunteers. So if anybody is so inclined, we have phone bankers as far away as Spain, mm -hmm. and you can sign up at Gen 2020. And please follow us on social media 
at JenFL23 on, on Twitter and Instagram. And we're at Jen2020 on Facebook. And just, you know, we are a campaign about getting the corporate money out and returning this to a term of service. And I also support term limits to that extent. And to me, this is something where the people sitting in those seats not only work for us, those are our employees. I want everybody to understand this. Those people that sit in Congress are your employees. They are not your leaders, they are your employees. They get health care. that's great. They get a pension, they get a staff of eight people, they get $174,000 a year, and they also then do the bidding of other corporations and they don't speak up for us. And I just want people to sit with that and understand what that means and if any other business you would allow your employees to be so insubordinate, because that's what they are. These are insubordinate employees. So if you are interested in having a representative that only speaks for the people, not big sugar, not big pharma, not the for-profit prison industry, you know, not any of those things, but just that's people. people that's fracking. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I'm one of those people that you, they have that fracking happening and my house is shaking, right? So they're See? taking money from those companies too. Yes, and if you are not in favor of getting us off of fossil fuels and you are not in favor of trying to have things like, you know, clean water, you know, that's the kind of thing that you're getting when you support corporate politicians. So if you like what you've heard, check out the policies on the website. There's obviously a lot more details there. But yeah, we need support. We're fighting a corporate monolith. And like I said, you're the first person who's even mentioned my race <laughs> in Broward <laughs> right. on the live stream. Crazy, right? But yeah, definitely. All right, so Gen2020. So sign off, gen2020.com um, and vote for you August 18th. August 18th. Well, actually, they can start voting now because if you did, if you requested your vote by mail ballot, yeah. Some people got them a few days ago. I think I got, I got mine too. So it came a few days ago and then they're going to have early voting. That's going to start August the 8th to the 15th, 8th to the 15th, 8th to the 15th. Yeah, 8th to the 15th. Um, so you can do early voting. And if you don't get to vote by mail or do early voting, then the last day that you can vote is August, August 18th. 18th by 7 p.m., <laughs> right? Because that's when the polling places are, are going to close. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much. All righty. Have a good one.